Welcome to my class on Ahum Administrative System. I am Orani Sekia from the Department of History, Nogao College. The Ahums had a sound administrative system which enabled them to rule for about 600 years. While there is a good deal of information about the administration of the Ahums in the 17th and 18th centuries, little is said about the government of the early Ahom kings in the Burundis. The system of government in its fully developed stage was partly monarchical and partly aristocratic. The king was called Swargadev, an Assamese equivalent to the word king of heaven. Divinity was attached to Ahom kingship and his person was considered sacrosanct and inviolable. All honors and prerogatives emanated from the king and all superior appointments were made by the king. The main duty of the king was the protection of his people. Another important function of the king was to conduct the foreign policy of the state. Great importance was attached to the coronation ceremony called Hingori Ghoruta, which was a very elaborate one. Followed by the king were the great nobles or great gohai. The king was assisted by a council of great gohais. There were originally two gohais, the Burha Gohai or the senior noble and the Bor Gohai or the great noble. In the reign of Sohung Mu, a new post entitled Borpatra Gohai, similar in dignity and power, was created. The most competent of the nobles served as the prime minister of the Ahom state, but the rank of all the three was always looked upon as equal. The king was bound by custom to consult the Gohais on all important matters such as war or negotiations with other countries. The office of the three Gohais was the monopoly of three particular families. Then there was the Patramondris. In the 17th centuries, two posts, namely Borborwa and Borfukon, were created by the Ahom king Patapkingho. Borborwa was the commander of all forces. He also looked after the revenue and judicial administration of the easternmost region. The first incumbent of the post of Borborwa was Mumai Tamuli. Borfukon governed the viceroy of the tract between Nogao and Gualpara with his seat of government at Gohati. Borfukan had to conduct the diplomatic functions with Bengal, Bhutan and other frontier countries. The office of the Borfukan was occupied for the first time by Longhi Panihya. In rank and dignity, these two officials were next to the three great Gohais. The Borborwa and the Borfukan, along with the three great Gohais formed a council of five known as Patramantri, function like modern cabinet. To each of these councillors was assigned a certain number of pikes or individuals over whom no other officers of the government had any control. The pikes rendered service for their masters at the time of war or in public utility works. There was a number of local governors who were next in power to the five councillors. The princes and the near relatives of the king were appointed as governors in certain areas and they were given the title of Raja. The heir apparent was usually made the governor of a tract called Sharing. The next in order of succession was the Tipam Raja. The frontiers of the kingdom were placed under Hodia Khwa Gohai, Morongi Khwa Gohai, Kajulimukhya Gohai. The province of Dorong enjoyed complete autonomy in its internal administration. So did the other vassal states like Rani, Beltola, Luki, Bor, Duar, Dimurwa, Neli and Gobha. All of them except the Raja of Rani had to pay in wealth tribute. They were bound to furnish the king with service of a stipulated number of pikes or money. In times of war, they had to assist their overlord. Now let's move to the military organization. The Ahom rulers resisted most of the invasions of the Turks and the Mughals from the west and the Noros from the east. This was by no means an achievement and it required a well-disciplined army. It was also a well-equipped well army with the full Ahom contingent consisting of infantry, navy, artillery, elephantry, cavalry and spies. The Ahom infantry is capable of taking up arms and of military exercises on all kinds of soils, hills or plain or in all weathers dry or wet. The great technical skill and general excellence of the Ahom foot soldiers used unanimously testified by the Persian writers. The Borborwa was commander of, of the force in chief of Upper Assam and Borfukon was the commander in chief of the force of Lower Assam. 
the gohais and even the king and the princess took to the field depending on the situation the ahom army had naval power the famous naval engagements at koliabor and horaigat surprised the mughals strong war boats were furnished with big guns and cannons that could carry up to 80 men a separate department under the supervision of an officer called Naukhulia Phukon took care of the navy. The appointment of spies was a regular practice. Before leading any expedition, spies were sent to the enemy's camp to study their strength and war strategy and they were informed back to the Ahom kings. The use of weapons was common among the Ahom soldiers. They were experts in making various kinds of guns, matchlocks, artillery, and big cannons. An officer called Kargoria Fukon superintended the manufacture of firearms and gunpowder. The main weapons of war were swords, spears, axes, daggers, bows, and arrows. The Ahum soldiers were trained to stand fire on the battlefield. The Ahoms also took particular care of the elephantry, which was placed under the supervision of an officer called Hatiburwa. Elephants were used to break through forts, forts and palisades and in traversing thick jungles, thus clearing an avenue for the infantry to pass through. There was the importance of cavalry in Ahom army. Sukafa had 300 horses. The work of cavalry was the supervision of the discipline of the army, lengthening its line, protection of its side, and first attack. There was royal physicians called Bezborwas who accompanied the Ahom military organization. Let's have a look on Ahom revenue administration. It evolved in a slow manner. In the conquered areas inhabited by the Nogas, Borahis, and the Morans, Sukafas appointed for the revenue purpose officers over certain units. For nearly three centuries, the Borgoha and the Burhagohai managed both civil and revenue matters. With further subjugation of the Borahis, Morans and Sutias, a third officer, Borpatra Guhai, was appointed. Sorgadev Gadadhar Singha worked out a detailed land survey based on Mughal system. The process continued during the rule of his successors and completed in the reign of Pramatta Singha. The final position regarding the administrative and revenue structure in Assam was as followed. The central area, first with Gorgaon and later from the end of 17th century Rangpur, the frontier governors at Sodia, Morongi, and Holal. The special case of Kamrup, which was the bone of contention between Assam and the Mughals. Besides it as adjoining areas including the Deshos of Dorong, Beltona, Rani, Luki, as well as the nine chieftainship of Gova, Neli, Panbari, and others under the jurisdiction of the Borfukon of Guwahati. The Ahum land system reflected the traditional tribe practice which was brought to Assam by the conquerors. Gradually, changes came to be introduced as a result of contact with the indigenous people. But the fundamental Thai concept of land ownership being vested not in the pikes or the people but in the king or the state continued in theory. The king could distribute land at his will and transfer the right of collection of dues to the donor individuals or institutions like temples or satras. Land ownership in the Ahom period represented a compromise between the state and private ownership, which eliminated the growth of landless peasantry. The Pike system was the system of rendering personal service to the state in lieu of a regular land tax. Pikes came to prevail all over the Upper Assam. A Pike was allotted in return of his service to the state two puras of best arable land called Gamati, free of chars. The pike has his garden land called Barimati, which he held as his private property on hereditary basis. Towards the later part of the home rule, when private property in the form of Barimati increased, a poll tax of rupee 1 was imposed. The mode of its collection was determined according to the custom of the locality. In Kamrup, it was a house tax called the Juhal Kor. In the eastern Assam, it was a poll tax called Gadhan. In the inundated parts of the country, lands were cultivated by ryots called Pomuas who paid a plough tax. The hill tribes who grew cotton paid a hoe tax. Artisans and others who did not cultivate land paid a higher rate of poll tax, which amounted to 5 rupees per head 
for gold washers and brass workers and 3 rupees in the case of oil pressers and fishermen. In Kamrup, the Pargana system largely prevailed, whereas in the tributary states of Rani, Luke and others, lands were held according to the old tribal system of on community basis. Now we move to the judicial administration of the homes. It was not spectacularly different from any other medieval system of administration in India. The king was the lawgiver, protector of justice, and therefore he acted without any fixed code of law. The people looked upon the king as the source of law and the fountainhead of divine dispensation. However, there was a force of tradition in the dispensation of justice. On important matters, the king was obliged to consult his official called Nyai Hodafukan and at times with the ministers. Below the king were the patramantris who also acted as judicial officers. Any person aggrieved by their decision could approach to the king for justice. At the bottom were officers called Fukon, Rajkwa and Borwa who did also exercise some judicial powers. Following their interaction with the Hindu philosophy and traditional jurisprudence, the Ahum rulers found it convenient to follow the Hindu law. In criminal cases, the monarchy did not depart from their traditional manners, but in civil matters, the Brahmin Pandits interpreted the Hindu laws in the trial court of the king. There are instances in the Ahum Buranji which suggest that Ahum judicial system was a little harsh in punishing the criminals. Physical punishments like removing of kneecap, severing hand, gogging out eyes were common. Stamping with heated iron, hanging were also carried out to the guilty rarely. Under this system, justice depended on the impartiality, integrity and wisdom of the king. As such, the possibility of a drift cannot be ruled out. We have seen in the Burunjis several kings of lesser ability as authors of injustice. With this, we end the discussion on Ahum administration. Further readings, H.K. Borpuzari, The Comprehensive History of Assam, Rai Sahib Gulab Chandra Borwa, Ahum Buranji, Sornalata Borwa, A Comprehensive History of Assam, Ramesh Burhagohai, Ahum State Formation in Media Assam, Edward Arthur Gate, A History of Assam. Thank you.